My name is Bronson Hill. I'm the CEO of Bronson Equity. We have about 200 million in multifamily assets. We also do things like ATMs, car washes, oil and gas, other sort of alternatives. We're going to have a great conversation today. This is the multifamily power hour with some power people that I admire a lot, some good friends of mine that are here. So I'm going to introduce them. We're going to jump into it. We're going to have a great conversation. And then toward the top of that, we're going to take some questions. So if you do have questions, there's things you're burning to ask these guys, which I know you are because I know I am. Uh, we're going to jump into it and we're going to get all the stuff of what people should be paying attention to right now. So I see people are fired up. I see some folks in the chat that looks like Max fire, Matt's fired up as well here. So um, so I'll go ahead and introduce each person that's on our panel, our great panelists. We have Matt Faircloth is here. Welcome, Matt. How are you today? I'm fantastic, Bronson. Thank you for having me as a part of this. And you're part of another event right now, your wife's event. So thanks for joining in the middle of that. Yeah. And excited to have you. Michael Blanc, uh, welcome. Excited to have thanks. you. Great to be here, Bronson. Great to have you. And we got Rod Khalif where it's always sunny in his Oh mindset. God, there goes, <laughs> there, there goes the neighborhood. There goes the neighborhood. <laughs> <That's> awesome. <laughs> guys, really excited to have you here. Thank you for being here. I know you guys have a lot of big fans. Thanks for helping promote this event as well. But uh, we're going to jump right in. Uh, let's get right into it. Obviously, we've done these panels. You know, Every month we do a panel, whether it's alternative investing or it's multifamily. I think we had uh, all of it. I think Matt is your first time with us, but we've had Rod and Michael a couple of times. Uh, it looks a lot different than it did a year ago. So talk to us a little bit about kind of what's changed in multifamily. Rates are higher. How is that impacting the ability to do deals? How is it impact, impacting operations? Uh, let's start with Rod with that one. Oh, I just saw my eyebrows go up. What's changed? Everything's changed. I mean, you know, uh, I mean, I think we're headed for incredible opportunity in the multifamily space. You know, sales are a 74% year over year decline first quarter of this year. Um, you know, we all know what's happened with the interest rates. And before we started uh, on, it, before we you dumped us in the um, webinar here, we were just chatting about, you know, there's a lot of fear in the air. There's a lot of operators mm -hmm. that that got uh, adjustable rate debt. And, uh, you know, there's 1.6 trillion in commercial real estate coming debt coming due by the end of next year. And so, you know, with debt coming due, an operator has two options, sell or refinance. And either both of those are, are looking challenging right now. And, you know, with the refinance, uh, if they go back into another adjustable rate situation, which many of them will have to, because, you know, the conforming debt is, is a, such a low loan to value right now, then, you know, they're, they're going to have to pay a significant rate cap to be able to do that. They're very often, they're going to have to interject money to be able to do that. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm not saying all this to scare you. I'm saying this to, frankly, for you to get excited if you get into this business now, and because there's going to be opportunity. I mean, sure, there's going to be pain. Um, and, uh, uh, which which is no fun, but but with crisis comes opportunity. So that's the way you know. I have to put on my rose colored glasses. If any of you know my story, I lost fifty million dollars in two thousand eight and nine, and so you know I'm carrying around that that dragging around that bag of history with me. Um, so I may be a little more bearish and a little more pessimistic than the other people on the panel here. I actually think the train's about to hit a brick wall, frankly. But you know we'll see what the other guys think. But you know I just saw today. That um, for the first time, in fact, my somebody on my team sent me a, a a note about credit card debt, and typically credit card debt gets paid down. And I'll I'll land the plane with this, but um, where is it? Here we go. Um, oh, I deleted it already. Well, anyway, the credit card debt's not being paid down right now for the first time in a in I think recorded history, which is kind of kind of alarming. <laughs> so you know, and and people are using credit cards to pay ordinary bills. Again, right. kind of alarming. Uh, banks failing, kind of alarming. You know, debt ceiling crisis. Uh, you know, Republicans and Democrats at each other's throats. Now, I'm assuming they're gonna they're gonna have to push forward with something because otherwise p bills aren't gonna get paid, people aren't gonna get paid. But now I'm I'm a bit of a bear right now. I think uh, I think we're gonna see some crazy times. Yeah, definitely challenging. I know once uh, as, as a personal level, like you said, once you've lost. 50 million and you made it, you know, everything is kind of uphill or everything's downhill from there, right? You're able to kind of move forward, but there's always opportunity. I love that. Uh, Michael, what are you seeing right now? It's an unusual time in the sense that we're playing defense while trying to play offense at the same time. It's so bizarre. So if you're invested in a multifamily deal, really any commercial deal, anything that has debt in it, you're going to be playing defense at the same time. There's, as Rod said, a lot of opportunity and you're going to try to take advantage of it. So it's, it's a very bizarre environment. Um, again, if you are invested in a, in a multifamily syndication, you know, your, your, your uh, cash flow may have been reduced or stopped entirely due to the incredibly rapid rise of interest rates. You may be in, involved in capital calls. 
uh, we're not immune from from capital calls is because these expiring uh, interest rate caps are staggeringly expensive. And so we're trying to deal with capital markets that no one could foretell, no one underwrote, even the most no. conservative people no. that could not underwrite. Right. We're dealing with financial products, insurance products that no one understands or can explain even to this day. An uh, interest rate cap that we bought for thirty, you know, thirty thousand dollars now is 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 eight hundred sixty thousand dollars. Like it's it's crazy, and even if a property is being operated well and, and actually cash flows well, we are not rewarded. We still are affected by uh, this 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 capital crisis for which we need money, and so operators are struggling with this particular thing. So if you're a passive investor in something, you now you know kind of what's going on. At the same time. There's opportunity, like Rod was talking about. There's a lot of operators who are not operating well. Now, for example, we did our first capital call a couple of weeks ago, and we had 85% participation. So we sold the capital call. Wow. Why? Because wow. because the property is performing. It's just you know it's before we just we just need to extend a runway. But there are a number of operators. We, they were in the news recently to 3,200 units in, in Houston, where they were most likely try to do a capital call and failed because the ship was sinking. Right, and no investor is going to throw good money after bad. So you're going to see operators who uh, who can't deal with the rising cost of their debts, uh, and they can't fund the capital, the, the extension of their of their rate cap. They're right. trying to do a capital call, and they can't fund it. So the only option back to Rod is they can they can't refinance because well they're under they're not performing. So right. the only option is two: one is to sell for pennies on a dollar or default. Right. So I think what's going to happen on the opportunity side is you're going to see a lot of pre default situations. I think a lot of GPs are going to reach out to other operators and there's some back channel communication where the operator wants to be taken out of their position. And this is why we have a resurgence in pref equity. Right. Pref equity are basically the sharks. They, they smell blood and they're circling. They're like, I'll save you. But in the process, I'm going to strip all the GPs from all the equity and I'll take half of the LP equity in the process. However, therefore avoiding foreclosure. So, uh, so at the same time, when we're playing defense, we're also trying to figure out how to play offense. Well, yeah, no, like you said, and 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 there are opportunity funds, you know, in play right now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, distressed asset funds and, and private equity, like you said, and and uh, you know, they're they're the sharks are swimming in the water because the blood is in the water. And you know, now listen, you know, there are a lot of fantastic operators out there as well. And I forgot this is more of a passive investor audience, so I, I you know, I don't want to scare the hell out of you, but you may have a capital call and you have to decide if it makes sense. But but. Um, you know, uh, it, it is, it is it, it right now more than ever, right? not to hog the, the mic here, but, you know, it, the it, asset management is critical. Paying attention to, you know, KPIs is critical. And so the, you know, the operators that, that, that really hone in on, on uh, uh, management right now are the ones that are going to, you know, prevail and, and really pay attention to, to, to their metrics and their KPIs on a very, very tight basis. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. I'll hop in. I think uh, Bronce is on his way back in here, but I just, yeah. but while we're, while we're waiting on that, I'll just throw my two cents. I think that it's like tale of two cities, right? Uh, you've got folks, uh, we have assets that we, you know, bought or refinanced under agency debt fixed mm -hmm. for like five, seven years. I got no one problem. that's at like, you know, 3.2%, which you couldn't put a gun to my head to sell right now because where else am I going to get 3.2% uh, debt, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there are, a lot of folks that bought pre-rate boom, uh, under fixed agency debt, uh, they're that are going to be, you know, maybe enjoying interest only. Maybe they're going to keep pushing rents and enjoying a nice spread of uh, of uh, of their NOI and cash flow for a while. Um, I don't think rates can stay high forever. I think that this is going to be like another 1970s kind of thing where rates spike for a while and they work their way back down. They and have to. Yeah, they have right and for all the reasons that Rod you alluded to you alluded to politics here. The government can't afford to keep rates where they because are. they're paying interest at those rates. I I just interviewed somebody on my show. Sorry to interrupt, but yeah. you know that the interest on the debt right now is about one point six trillion a year, and yeah. the U.S. only pulls in a little under four trillion a year. So yeah. you take that with it as you weigh. But so that rates have to come down. Yeah, so, I've heard, yeah. I heard. I didn't hear the exact. I'd heard this like a third of of whatever we make as yeah. a country. Yeah. Yeah. A third goes towards it, but they're not even writing that check. They're just going to print more money to pay that, right? So, um, but anyway, the government can't afford to keep rates high. So they're going to have to come back down. So there are a lot of operators out there 
then I'm like, well, why would I sell and into a distressed market? You know, why would I, why would I just hold this asset? So I think a lot of folks are going to sit on their pens and not sell if they can, um, if they can. And there's yeah. a lot of folks that can. You know, right. um, I think the other thing that we haven't talked about yet is there is a ownership demographic. The the air quote mom and pop or the baby boomer generation, the the nineteen the, the the seventy the seventy to eighty year olds that are owning multifamily that that were like the uh, the multifamily OGs if you will that own that I'm working with one of these folks right now that owns the building free and clear and I think that there are opportunities to work with folks like that and get a lot more creative. I mean the the person that bought the building. Two years ago, uh, on on fixed on floating rate debt is going to have to do, you know, have the difficult conversation with their investors and do the capital call if they don't want to if they don't want to do that, don't have the courage to do that like Michael did to say, okay, this is what we're gonna this is what we're gonna do this is how we're gonna move the ship forward. If they're not willing to have those capital calls, then you're probably going to see more distressed assets come on. Uh, I think that it's not going to be I this is just you know Matt Fairclough's humble humble opinion. I don't think we're going to see blood in the streets, but I think that if the, the operators that are very market focused, that are saying, okay, I'm looking for opportunities that show up in these geographic markets, you're going to see like opportunity whack-a-mole. It's going to pop up and then it's going to get scooped up by, the, by someone who's uh, surveying that market that has good capital lined up, investors on the investors ready to jump in. So, uh, so that, I think that's where it's going to go. But I don't think there's going to be, you know, a 19 or a 2008, you know, everything gets cut in half because I just don't see the equation there. But I do think that a lot of deals are going to have to get traded. And, uh, and uh, no, there's no, going to be, I agree. To I agree completely. Irony, I agree completely. The irony is that the fundamentals are still very strong. I mean, yeah. we, had a, we had a huge run up in rents. I mean, ridiculous, right? So they, was, they've, yeah. they've come down and start normalizing, but year over year, they're still up like 10%. Yep. Okay. They're, yep. they're not building any more affordable housing, right? So no. this in my mind, right? If I study Warren Buffett, He'd be backing up the truck right now. He doesn't buy real estate, but if he did, he'd be backing up the truck right now because he buys uh, str uh, companies with strong fundamentals that are temporarily undervalued for some strange reason. And I feel like that's where we are right now. We're, we're undervalued temporarily for some yeah. strange reason. And therefore, you know, I, well, I'm strange just, reason. Uh, they just printed trillions of dollars. There's your no, reason. Well, so <laughs> the, the, the challenge is going to be right. Is, is how do we raise money in this kind of environment? Because yeah. we just did a capital call, right? You, you, people are reading the headlines, they're all in cash right now. They're like, oh crap, I'm just gonna wait. Oh, no, no, you don't understand. We get this awesome multifamily. You know, I forget the one we bought two years ago, that was crap, but this one is different. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally different. And people are going to go, I don't know. I don't know. Well, I, I yeah. think, I think yeah. you just have to, I think you have to, you know, talk to your investors and let them know that there is going to be opportunity. And if you're locked in fear with your money in the bank, well, we know what's happening with inflation. They say it's five, six, 7%. It's more like 20%. And, and so, you know, you're, that's eating away at your, per, in, at your purchasing power. And, yep. and there's no better asset, obviously, than real estate. And it kills me. I've got millions in the bank right now. It's killing me. But I'm I'm getting ready, you know, because in a crisis, cash is king. And and if you know, I even if it's not a crisis, let's say I'm over exaggerating how bad it's going to be. I promise you, there's going to be deals in in these in these loans that are coming due. This 1.6 mm -hmm. trillion, which is not a small amount, that's coming due by the end of next year. So, you know, uh, will it be blood in the streets? Maybe not. I but let, but, let's. Yeah, let's sorry, that's a really. I want to. I want to interrupt. I know I've dropped off for a minute, but great question here. So this is a lot. Ask a very a lot of very smart people this question. Mm -hmm. Are you sitting primarily in cash? Do you have a lot in cash? Bloomberg came out with an article and said we have four or five times the amount. The Amer average Americans, just as a whole, it's like five trillion dollars in cash or in you know financial accounts. It's four or five times what it was in 2020, which was the highest. So the confused mind says to wait or wait for a good deal. Do you think it's better to deploy as much as you can or to save? You know, it's better to deploy or save. I'd love to start with Matt on that one. Yeah. Yeah. I, so we are not only doing multifamily anymore because I'm investing in things that cash flow. Because I believe that the the, the investment up until now, the the darling of of investing was was appreciation. You know, operators were producing thirty percent IRR not by buying deals that were making money day one, but by buying deals that were worth X 
day one and worth 2x a year from then, right? Um, and the up market made a lot of people look smart. To the, I think we're going to go back to investing fundamentals. We as a company would not do a deal that doesn't make money the first day that we buy it. And that's what stopped us from buying a lot of multifamily deals because a lot of- You mean cash flow or, 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 or your equity position in that deal? No, no, no. Uh, it, it's got to make cash flow. Like it's, gotcha. if, I buy a, gotcha. if I buy an Good. apartment building, it, right. it's got to yield something in, for investors. Day one. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and we've also changed our model up too. And I don't know if, uh, Michael, I know you and I have talked about this, Rod, I'm curious about you as well. We are are no longer quoting a pref to investors. We're talking oh. about just straight equity splits. Because mm -hmm. no, that's they, safer. I mean, that yeah. that's, that's, and that's, you know, some investors may have an issue with that. Uh, you know, we, okay. we haven't done one like that. I'm not saying we wouldn't, but, yeah. uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, uh, that uh, that's a smart move, actually. Yeah. And that's a, you know, it's a conservative play. And right now, the name of the game is conservative. I mean, yeah. massively conservative. And so, you know, uh, and what does that mean? That means you stress test your deal like crazy. You know, you, you, you're you being super conservative on your exit cap rate, your exit interest rate, if you're going to try to refinance. Um, you know, you've got extra operating reserves. I mean, like we just stopped the CapEx on, on a beautiful 296 unit asset we've got with 3.2% debt as well, by the way. And we stop in the CapEx for a little bit just to yep. conserve some cash. It's kind of a C plus B minus asset. And we just saw a bump in our evictions. We're like, you know what? stop. We're going to stop yep. spending money for a little bit, just see what happens and see if our tenant base really gets in trouble. You know, when I see these headlines about credit card debt not being paid down, you know, you got to pay attention to stuff like that, right? And so, you know, uh, and and will we, you know, we'll, we just got to weather this thing, that's all, and, and all the operators do. And there'll be some that have to, like you say, have to have a liquidation event of some sort or get some mm -hmm. get some opportunity money coming in or whatever and do what they have to do to survive. And there'll be some that don't survive, like that 3,300 unit comp, you know, those complexes in Houston. And, and wow. you know, there's a lot of fire sales going on now in office as well. I don't know if you saw that. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it's crazy. They're, they're selling for literally cents on the dollar in the office space. Uh, so the, the yeah, data yeah. that I heard on office, by the way, Rod, is I know we're not talking all about office here, Bronson, right. Bronson but it's just interesting data sure. is that the, the national uh, vacancy rate on office is something like 25 to 30 percent. Isn't that crazy? Well, see, right. see, see, right. how, that, are that, gonna, how are those folks going to, how are they going to, What's yeah. scary about that is that debt has got to get handled somehow. So there's yeah. going to be a lot of bank failures. Okay. I'm just telling you. So if you've got your money in a small bank, more than 250 grand, I would rethink that. Okay. Because yeah. Uh, they're talking like, I, I think I saw an article said 190 banks look like they're on the edge right now. So, you know, wow. all of these things come into play. They're going to scare investors. If you're in a, if you're a passive investor listening here, you know, I'm probably going to scare you a little bit, but, but that would be a mistake. Okay. Because again, with crisis comes opportunity. And if you're, if you, if you hang your hat with a, you know, a, a seasoned operator that's conservative then and and I'm not saying me. I'm just saying a seasoned operator that's conservative that you you know you that you you know do your due diligence on you know exponential opportunity is is going to be here. And so you know if you if you're hiding like this and 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 in your corner scared, you're going to miss out on that. And that would be a crime, frankly, because so, so we, you know yeah yeah. I mean, like Bronson that. asked you know should we sit on the sideline for past investing? Should we be in cash? And yeah. And, and so I, and, and I, I jokingly said that the multifamily from two years ago is vastly different from the multifamily today. Actually, I think that's, that's very, very true. I think what's more important than any time before in history is looking at the risk-adjusted return. You're not looking at a return, you're looking at the risk profile. Mm -hmm. If you look at the deal we closed on two months ago, it is vastly different than the deal we may have bought two years ago. Mm -hmm. We bought an extraordinarily expensive four-year uh, rate cap. We paid like $2.2 .2 million for it, right? Wow. We, we have... Our, our, the cap rates are higher. It has been in the last 10 years. Okay. And so uh, interest rate is higher than we've ever seen in a long, long time. Right. So we're underwriting at, at what we think is like the high point. Okay. At the very high point, most likely interest rates and cap rates are going to stay the same or, you know, go down. Start right? coming down. Yeah. And, and two years ago, everybody knew, oh my gosh, cap rates are probably going to go up. Interest rates are probably going to go up. Right. And so, so the multifamily that you buy right now looks, is underwritten vastly different from a multifamily that was two years ago. And I think as an investor, you have to understand the, the differences and really look at the risk adjusted return on what the underlying assumptions are, how the deal is underwritten and how, how appropriate the deal is given the current market environment. And then you can see, you can make your own decision. 
right? Yeah, how so, aggressive or conservative are they are they underwriting this thing? And yeah. you've got to look at that. Another another thing that that another elephant in the room is insurance. I don't know if you guys have seen yeah. this, but in our southern yeah. assets, Quadrupled. we're yeah. seeing Florida. insane increases in insurance, which which massively impact you know your NOI and your returns. And so, you know, that's another factor that that you have to take into account. Um, mm-hmm. In fact, we've even started targeting um, further, you know, other states that we normally wouldn't target uh, because of that insurance, this whole insurance dynamic. Um, so. You know, that's another factor. Yeah, we're, we're seeing that in Florida as well. Just the, oh, yeah. some of the insurance costs have quadrupled in certain areas. Right. And so, and, right. and it's interesting having conversations with investors because we're like, hey, well, things are going fine on the deal, but, you know, maybe distributions have stopped or maybe we're just trying to preserve capital. So it's been, like you said, Michael, it's been a defensive game while you're trying to move forward and get those renovations done. Ken McElroy's called 2023 the year of operations, right? It really separates good yeah. operators that's from bad it. operators, people that mm-hmm. were conservative, that weren't conservative. Um, I, this question comes up. I've gotten this from a couple investors that have just reached out saying, hey, I've got a capital call situation. Uh, you know, wh- what questions should I be asking in this situation mm-hmm. when I contact the operator? What do you guys think, Matt? What, what are some questions? If there's a capital call, what are some things you should look at? Like, hey, should I put money into this? Is this bad money after good? Or do they really have a plan to move forward here? Well, you just said it. What's the plan, right? Yeah. Uh, you, you know, uh, wh- where are you going with this money? Are we just like, you know, plug it holes? Uh, or are we going to, you know, round second base if we're on floating rate debt? Uh, how are we going to get out of it? What are the, re- you know, if the property, if the exit is to refinance six months from now, whatever it is, what are the refinance terms that we're looking at? So I, I would want to see a, say, a 90 and a one year and a two year business plan uh, for the property. So obviously, stabilization plan, like get us through the next 90 days because you're doing the cash call because we're running a little bit lower because we got, we've got a problem we're dealing with. And then what are we going to do for a year and two years? And obviously, how are we going to get our money back? And maybe how are we going to win even further here uh, in the long game? Because uh, I hate to say this, but as an investor, you wouldn't want to throw good money after bad. Um, and just to put more money into a sinking ship, you want to see that this is going to aid the initial money you had and maybe make a good return on it as well. And stabilize yeah. the asset. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. No, is there a specific plan? Um, let's let's talk for a minute. I want to shift gears for a minute. We can come back to multifamily, but I know some of you, and we've started doing this as well about a year ago, we started doing a lot more things outside of real estate, such Mm -hmm. as ATMs and car washes and oil and gas and things like that. Are you guys doing things outside of that, either personally or in your business? Love to hear from anybody. Not me. Yeah. Michael? Uh, Yeah. We we started expanding a a little, a little bit into an oil and gas. And what we found is that it's a, we were looking for ways to uh, better serve our investors with non-correlated asset classes. And we found that oil and gas is one of those things. Um, They're, they have even better tax benefits, right? There's high cash flow, completely non-correlated. Uh, there's a lot of benefits. And ATMs, you mentioned ATMs. I love, I love that. Uh, real businesses like car washes, right? So just if you put yourself in the, in the shoes of an investor, you want to be an advisor to investors. And you want to put yourself in the shoes and, and figure out how you can help them and really educate them about different asset classes. And within an asset class, even different risk profiles, even a multifamily, right? You can talk about risk profiles of stuff or people who bought uh, fixed interest rate, uh, use fixed interest rate loans versus floating rate without a cap, like, you know, super high IRR. So the different asset classes. And so we have started to expand into those things. And we found that uh, the vast majority of the investors, when we started raising capital for uh, an energy fund, is a completely new person. They, they, they didn't invest in any multifamily at all. For some reason, they just weren't attracted to multifamily for some reason. And it just shows that it's a, it is a vastly different asset class. So, uh, so from our perspective, if we were going to serve our investors better, then we should be looking at different asset classes like, like you are, Bronson. Yeah, I think it's interesting. We've realized with our ATM fund, we actually have it open right now. And there's a, uh, up till next week, uh, it's open. So if anybody wants to reach out, but uh, it, you know, it will draw a lot of investors in. And honestly, as an operator, it's a little thinner as far as the margins, because we look at that as well. Hey, if we're going to raise, we're going to do this. It's just a small fee, but it serves investors well because it cash flows, right? So like you mm-hmm. talked about it, Matt, cash flowing investments. Yep. Um, a lot of the cash flow that I had personally uh, in multifamily, it's kind of dried up. And it's not that it's these deals aren't great deals, they're working well, we're gonna be refinanced, we'll be able to sell, but it's changed. So I feel like cash flow has a whole nother uh, you know, priority there. And I think right now in multifamily, it's hard to find cash flow. Rod, you look like you're chomping at the bit to say. Uh, yeah, I, I am just because, you know, when you talk about cash flow, because that's the name of my podcast, yeah. but I, I wrote a book and this is not me to sell the book. I give this thing away for free, but the new the the subtitle of the book is the new rules of real estate investing. And this this is 
seven years old, but they were the same rules back then. And it's all about cash flow. I'll get students that call me and say, Hey, this, this guy bought this place for 5 million three years ago, and I can get it for three. I'm like, I don't care what's the freaking cash flow. You know, it's all about the cash flow. And so, you know, if you're listening and you're thinking about being an operator, that should be your number one focus. It doesn't matter, you know, uh, what what it traded at, what it appraised for, you know, uh, unless it's based on NOI and cash flow. Uh, so, so uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, and and that goes for any business. And and I'll be and just to throw my two cents in, we're talking about other other assets. Certainly, there are other asset classes in real estate that I think have a lot of promise: self storage, mobile home parks, um, you know, uh, flex space, industrial. I think there's there's real opportunity and all that. I don't think I'd mess with even retail right now, but definitely not office. But but there, you know, there are 80 million baby boomers getting old and getting cold. Okay. And there are a lot of business owners there. I think there's an opportunity to buy businesses as well, frankly, and something I love uh, uh, as well, but uh, I'm not making, you know, I, I try to not dilute my focus too much, you know, because every right. time I have diluted it, I get my butt handed to me. So, and that's a challenge, you know, if you're and yeah. this a challenge for all of us and being multifamily guys, it's hard to like, how do we mm -hmm. branch out? And we've, we've started branching out more to do more alternatives. Matt, what are you doing besides uh, real estate now? I think you well, said you're again, it goes back to like, seems to be perhaps the theme of this conversation, which is cash flow. We're, uh, we are in the middle of a uh, launching a debt fund. Um, mm -hmm. So Good we're idea. doing a, we're partnering with existing hard money lending company um mm -hmm. that uh that, that has a good a good uh, ticker to, to buy distressed debt again. or to, or to actually loan no we're going to put it to we're going to there's a hard money lending company that's already put money to work we're going okay. to be partnering with them just put dollars to work at, oh interesting you know okay. 12 13 percent on the street to fix and flippers to folks uh, we got a, a deal right now a guy ran out of gas renovating a hotel needs okay. hard money to come in needs 800k to get him across the finish line and it's worth a good bit more th than uh, than what he's into it for plus the 800 so it's a good deal with plenty of uh, a built-in equity up top he's got a lot of his own skin into the game so it's examples like that and i think that there's going to be people that are going to be running out of gas here and there in today's market as things change and they're going to be seeking bridge capital sure. Folks sure. that are going to treat hard money the right way, they're going to treat it like a hot potato. They're going to get in, they're going to use it, and they're going to give it back. Um, and that, so that's that we're partnering with an existing hard money lender. We're not looking to do uh, relief or mez or prep or distressed debt at this point. Not that I don't believe in that, but I want to keep it simple. And also, I want something that's got a collateralized lien on the property. God forbid sure. we got to take it back if we need to. Sure. Um, so that's what we're doing because debt yields cash flow day one. When I get in, you know, mm -hmm. that, that, uh, that performing borrower, debt. Yeah. They owe me a monthly <laughs> right. check, right. They, they owe me right. a check, right. The, the day that we issue that loan, they owe me money back. So, um, and I can start uh, producing uh, distributions to investors right after they get into the project. So we're going to do that as a blend with uh, other multifamily assets we have already. So not looking to get a multifamily. It's still my passion, it's still my core. Um, but I also want to produce something that benefits investors from a cash flow right. perspective. No, I think the debt, I think the debt, the debt side is really interesting because then if if the asset doesn't perform, potentially that can take over or mm -hmm. potentially you know get it control of the asset, which is is definitely attractive. Let's talk well, for a minute, guys. Uh, yeah, it yeah. I, I'm gonna I I just remember what happened in 08 and 09 and you know, some of those lenders that took back assets really, you know, didn't, didn't make up well. very well. Took the bath. Um, right. <laughs> God, God, God help us if if we have a crash like that. So. Yeah. And it's interesting with, you mentioned the inflationary environment. It's just, I think it's a different time because of all this money that's been created. It's almost like the crack boom kind of thing, right? Where it's like, so I guess let's ask that question. The Fed at some point, whether this is three months, it's six months, it's 12 months, it's 24, they're going to start stabilizing rates. They're going to have that first drop of 25 basis points. And what is going to happen at that? I, I have an opinion on what's going to happen, but I want to hear from you guys. Why don't we start with Michael? What's going to happen once the Fed says, hey, I think we're good here, we're going to start gradually lowering rates. What's going to happen to lending? What's going to happen to multifamily? Oh, boy. Well, I, so in, in, in general, okay, <clears throat> here's what's going to happen is there's going to be some kind of crisis, okay, brought about by something, okay, another bank failing or whatever, okay, whenever that is. And, and so I think the Fed is basically going to stay where they are right now. But as soon as there's any crisis, the Fed's going to bail out the crisis, and they're going to do it with what they always do. They're going to lower interest rates and print more money because it worked so well over the last 20 years. Why, why, why change your MO? And, and that's going to be just great short term for us because inflation long term is fantastic for us. What's sucked the last 12, 24 months is the rapid rise in interest rates and 
the fear factor. So, so the, the, the risk of lending has gone up. Therefore, uh, lenders have actually increased their lending criteria. They didn't, their lo loan to value has gone down and that has driven prices down. That, that thing has driven prices down. It's a lower LTV and the higher interest rates that have really kind of crushed the market a little bit. So I think if, if there is no crisis for the foreseeable future, okay, interest rates are going to stay low. The, the, the fear is going to squeeze out of the market and the lending environment is going to start to thaw and normalize a little bit. You're going to see some of the, the requirements relax a little bit. People are going to settle down a little bit. But I just, I think there is going to be a crisis. There's going to be some crisis. And, and we talked yeah. about some of them, but it could be a tsunami off the coast of freaking Tokyo for all I care. Okay. And it's call it a catalyst. Crazy. Call it a catalyst. There's going to yes. be a catalyst. Yeah. There's going to be yeah. a yeah. catalyst. There's, there's enough stuff brewing. Okay. There's going to be some mm -hmm. catalyst. Mm -hmm. And the Fed is just going to bail out. There's no way the Fed is not bailing out a, 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 a calamity. It's just, they were always done. And so, yeah. so what's going to happen is going to, it's going to give the, us and us an, an opportunity to get out of some of our, capital distress that we're in refinance and gotta go right for the for the for the moment and then and then do some other stuff so yeah, i think yeah. that's what's gonna what's gonna happen I, I don't i don't see rates going up for very much for the reasons you mentioned and i just i just think the fed has been bluffing they're not really committed to fighting inflation at all because what they really want to do is avoid a recession yeah. yeah well i think i think that ship has sailed but um you know i, I I don't know that the interest rates have had that big an effect on inflation anyway. It, it's, it's, no. you know, it's the, it's the quantitative tightening, the, 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 that, that really impacts. I don't know. You know, we'll see, we'll see what happens. It's, it's a, it's a crystal ball thing and there's so many pieces involved in it, but uh, you know, just a lot of these, a lot of these things that are happening, like with the credit card debt with uh, and um, this, the, the, really the globe, the, U.S. debt and and that rising and the interest on that debt is just some you know I think there's just a lot of ca potential catalysts for for uh, the the spending limit or the the borrowing limit that they're fighting over right now you know it's just a lot of things that could could uh, I mean I, I just was reading an article Jamie Dimon head of Chase they literally have a war room in case that they don't agree on the debt ceiling they're meeting every single day as to what ifs that's how big a deal they're concerned about yeah. so um, you know we'll see I mean uh, amazing. Again, it, it's it, it. You just can't get caught up in fear. That's the important thing that 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 I want to tell you. Be very very clear on on what you might do to take advantage of what's coming. Mm -hmm. Invest in in you know with a good operator in multifamily or another asset class that makes sense to you or another vehicle that makes sense to you. Uh, you know, educate yourself if you want to do it yourself. Um, but uh, you know, don't 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 hide your head in the sand because there will be incredible opportunity regardless of how it shakes out. That's great. Thanks, Rod. What about you, Matt? What do you think's coming when rates start to stabilize and come down slightly? I know you I, well, laugh when you ask that question. You laughed I, twice. I, 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 my crystal ball is broken, man. I mean, like, yeah. it's one of those things where it's like, I have no, I have no freaking idea, man. You know, I mean, I don't think a lot of people thought that rates were going to go up as quickly as they did um, or the domino, you know, I mean, it's, it's easy to hindsight and say we all predict this was going to happen, but I mean, you know, I, I think it, it, it happened really freaking fast. And so I think that whatever happens is going to happen really freaking fast again as well. And I think Michael nailed it that some catalyst will happen and that'll cause what Rod alluded to, to be, you know, the credit card debt. And a lot of other things, if you look at COVID, that was a thing that happened mm -hmm. and what COVID and what that singular event did it accelerated things that were happening already. And so the, the next catalyst will cause other dominoes to fall. So maybe cause default on the credit card side, maybe cause a, a bunch of other banks to fall apart. I think that we're going to limp along until there is another major event. You know, yeah. I, I don't believe the government's got the courage. They're, they're going to play chicken all the way up until like, you know, May, 20, May 29th, the media is going to have a field day with it. And they're going to sell lots of advertising for us all watching, you know, Bloomberg to see what happens. Right. And then they're going to work it out. Um, they have to, they have to, uh, just that's, yeah. that's a given. Yeah. It has to get worked out. To me, I've had investors come in. Well, what if they don't? Well, they, they, it's, it's not worth discussing because uh -huh. the ramifications of what would happen to the government, what we're talking about happening is the government not being able to pay its bills anymore. Right. right. Um, and it's just not, not going to happen. They, it's not yeah, going to, they can always they, create more currency. They know, right. Yeah. They, they know how bad, how much, how bad do you know what would hit the fan if, if the government decided not to pay its obligations. So let me, let me, let me, let me throw something in, you know, when, yeah. when COVID hit, I thought that was going to be the catalyst. I don't know about mm -hmm. the rest of you guys. I actually thought that was going to be the catalyst and, and it wasn't. Yeah. And, and the thing I want to point out to those of you in passive investing in multifamily, multifamily got a lot of money. 
Industrial didn't get money. Retail didn't get money. You know, uh, uh, office didn't get money, but multifamily, and we got hundreds of thousands of dollars in rent relief for our tenants mm -hmm. uh, in, in some of our C-class assets. So, you know, that's kind of, uh, you know, and I want to point something else out. Even in the great crash of 2008 and nine. Multifamily rents exceeded pre-crash levels within three years, less than three years of that mm -hmm. crash. So, you know, multifamily is a pretty solid freaking asset class. It really is uh, comparatively, you know, to other asset classes. Let me let me piggyback on that real quick, yeah. Bruce, yeah. if you don't mind. There, yeah. there is a quite, I don't think that my company, DeRosa Group's the one to do it, but maybe somebody listening here is to do it, or maybe one of you guys, right? There is a amazing correlation between the housing crisis we have in this country, which we still need more housing. We, you know, even yeah. with everything happening, we need more places for people to live, sure. right? And cost of living has gone up, and so there's there, there's a good yield that could be, that could be made in creating places for people to live. That's one thing. Um, on the other side, you've got all these office buildings who are about to get completely decimated and everything like that. There is a major opportunity to take office space and turn it into residential space, mm -hmm. or to take other to, to do repositioning of assets. And perhaps the office building could get bought literally for pennies on the dollar and get turned into residential spaces. And maybe the local town would be willing to give you zoning variances and things like that. Um, again, I don't think my company's got the-, the I've got students doing anymore. it, but yeah, it, it, I agree with yeah, you. It, it, they're it's, gonna it's have to come up with something. Or they're, they're going to have to come up with some new use because people yeah. want to work from home. I mean, that's it's. Right. I don't think they're going to reverse that trend. I really don't. I, right, so that, I see that to be the, a billion dollar industry that hasn't completely come to fruition yet in, yeah. the, in the conversion of space, you know? Yeah. So I wanted to share this. We kind of went around and we talked about, you know, what's going to happen. My opinion is uh, I'm about 95% deployed, so I'm not holding a lot of cash. I have a little bit of cash, but I think that once rates tick down a little bit. I think lenders are going to start lending again, as Michael was sharing. It's just, it's going to be a whole different environment. All this cash that's sitting on the sidelines will want to try to find assets. And I think we'll look back on this time and say, gosh, I wish I owned a lot more apartments because the demand is there. All these different factors are there. All these things are there. And, you know, somebody, yeah. This is the problem, Bronson. And, 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 and is, there's a lot of fear right now, right? And so right. people are always trying to time the market. They always ask me, is now the right time to get started right. or should I wait? The, the honest truth is it's never the right time to get started because right now is the time to get into it, but there's so much fear. People are like, oh no, I shouldn't get started. And then yeah. the fear goes away and then greed takes over and people are like, oh no, it's too hot. I should wait till it cools. And, <laughs> and they never get into it because it, it, it pendles between fear and greed, yeah. right? Here, here's the bottom line. If the freaking numbers make sense, it doesn't matter where you are in the cycle. Yeah. If you're right now, you've got to be more conservative. Would you agree with me, Michael? I mean, it just doesn't matter. Yeah. You just you just got to get started. And 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 if you're going to do it, you know, obviously you want to be more conservative today. But but there are good deals in any part of the market cycle. People ask me all the time, should I wait to, to, to invest, wait to get started? I'm like, no, we've got LOIs out on stuff right now. But they're mm -hmm. very, very conservative deals. Um, so, and so the so opportunities that are out there, I know list are you about office conversions, that's a big opportunity, mm -hmm. uh, owner financing, assuming loans. Uh, mm -hmm. What are some things, maybe you guys can talk about that. What are the opportunities that are out there you're making offers on? Well, I think there's going to be opportunities for creative financing as well. I don't know, Matt or Michael, if you guys yeah. have, have started doing that. I've got some students that have already, you know, seller financing, seller, seller stays in the deal, you know, put some, put some equity in the deal, mm -hmm. you know, so there's, there's creative financing starting to come out. Um, but uh, anyway, I'll let you guys. Well, I'll there. throw it on that. Brad just said it. It's assuming that you can assume the uh, the seller's debt, you know, like the, you know, called like sub two, like subject to. And what's funny is Fannie and Freddie, they're okay with that. You know, you can, sure. you can assume an agency loan, mm -hmm. typically get to pay an assumption fee, you know, uh, and, and, and everything like that, but you can assume debt. Um, we are. And some of those are really attractive, Matt. I mean, there's, yeah. there's deals out there at three, 4% that are freaking screaming assumptions, right? You just got to raise yeah, more right. equity. Yeah. Right. And then that's okay. Right. Maybe you're buying it for 50% uh, LTV. I'm not right. going to put a supplemental or like a second mortgage on it. Cause that's going to cost me seven or 8%. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I'll just raise more and, uh, and, and buy it uh, with a lower interest rate on it. But there's another one that we're negotiating right now, where, as you said, the seller would stay in the deal uh, at a minority equity position. The thing is though, guys, that if you're going to negotiate stuff like this, uh, the brokers can be deal killers because they, they end up not understanding quite what you're looking to do. They just want to see an easy, quick closing where their commission check comes out nice and clean at the end um, and that. So I found that the only way you can get really creative to make real deals happen 
is to get in front of the seller direct, yeah. you know, and, and have a heart to heart. Let's make this happen. I, I can't tell you how many deals I've closed in my career, just sitting with the seller over a beer and figuring it out, you know? Um, yeah. And, and, and if, if the broker was involved in that, it, it would have gotten a smoke bomb <laughs> thrown into the room because they don't trust that it's going to close and their precious commission is going to happen. Right. So it's, it's less impactful yeah. on the larger deals on the yeah. smaller deals. You definitely, if a broker is involved, forget it. It's, it's very difficult to do it on the larger deals. You know, there's usually enough money going in that the broker is going to get paid and you know, yeah. they're a little more sophisticated, but I agree with mm -hmm. you. Yeah. 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 Great. What else? Any other op opportunities you guys are seeing now or things that, you know, to watch out for, I guess the next, you know, over summer, fall, we're coming into election, you know, we're ways out from an election, but you know, that's starting to kind of ramp up here mm -hmm. too, but um, obviously there could be a crisis, you know, we somebody mentioned a crisis that in California, there were mudslides in one small area of California. And so what they did in California, which makes a lot of sense, they made the entire state has a, a free uh, extension, an IRS extension on their taxes. So you don't have to file it, but it was only for this one little county. It's like some obscure county in Northern California. But it's funny how like never let a good crisis go to waste, right? So there's gonna be some crisis that, or some uh, catalyst that comes up that's gonna become a crisis that all of a sudden we've got, you know, other things that are- Well, are my, my, my wife's black, so I'm sending her to California because I think she's gonna get 3 million bucks here in reparations <laughs> here. Just kidding. Sorry, yeah. I couldn't resist. Well, Newsom <laughs> just broke the budget though. I think they realized, it's oh- God, it's you, you surplus. can't make some of this stupid shit up it's, you really yeah. can't i mean yeah. good lord but anyway sorry i went political i shouldn't have done it but i did anyway <laughs> well, you, live, you live in florida so it's easy yeah. to uh you know, yeah. back to your question what you look out for it's, it's tough to say because we don't know no, no one could have foretold covid no one could have foretold the rise in interest rates i mean yeah. but the thing that we're doing is is just trying to be as conservative as possible yeah so that we have we have we have multiple points of failure so <laughs> in other words it, for for us not to operate profitably means that there have been multiple points of failure along the way, which is very unusual. I mean, it's an unusual environment we're in, but, but you know, that's the best thing you can do. The, the other option is simply not to do anything. And for me, that's not an option because one should always, as an entrepreneur, figure out what, how to make something happen, how to turn something an opportunity. Yeah. And so I just think you gotta, you gotta do the best you can with what you're handed at the time. And that is to make, uh, do conservative underwriting and, but still get the deal done. And it, it served us well up to now, uh, but this and it and it would have worked great in 2008 as well, right? I mean, it, 2008 wasn't nearly as bad as uh, as the environment we were in the last 12 months. Now mm -hmm. it'll be interesting when we sit here again a year from now and look back on this, Bronson. Yeah. I'd be curious to see what we say, right? Because it it could go either way. It could be a complete crap show, right? Where yeah. the, the world goes to hell in the handbasket, or we're like, oh, phew, that was actually yeah. pretty good. Multifamily did really really well, like it did in COVID. We we don't know. We'll do the best yeah. we can. No, yeah, I, agree, right. I agree with you. I agree with you. But like, like McElroy said, it's, it's right now it's super tight asset management. Like Michael, you're looking yeah. at every possible scenario. You're looking, you know, that's what an entrepreneur does. An entrepreneur doesn't die until they, like, they're like a shark until they stop swimming, you know, and, and, and right now yeah. mindset is so freaking important, you know, and, and, you know, guys, you know, I'm known for that, but, but it's, uh, it, it's, it's right now more than ever. If you're watching this, you're a leader. And right now the world needs leaders more than ever. But as a leader, you got to pay attention to what you're focused on. Because whatever you focus on is going to get larger, both positive or negative. So, you know, you got to be really manage the news, manage the negativity, um, be real clear on what you want. Make sure you've got your goals done. Um, if, if you click on my little QR code there at the bottom of that link tree is my goal setting workshop. It's free. I'm not going to try to sell you anything. You know, uh, do, do your goals, get clear on what you want so that you're focused on that instead of all the crap in the news. And, and then you'll thrive through this. Okay. You'll be focused on positive things and you'll have that forward momentum. Just don't get sucked into the fear. Uh, we'll take some questions here in a minute. If you have any questions, uh, you know, just go ahead and put that in the chat there. I've been fact checked. I guess there were many counties affected in California. There wasn't <laughs> this year. So oh. California, uh, we can That's have a conversation on the offline about how great Stand California. corrected. Stand corrected. <laughs> So um, it was all justified. Uh, anyway, I know we have a couple questions uh, coming up. I know people are going to have questions. Go ahead and stick it in the chat here. Uh, you know, should we fill reserve first and CapEx? I'm not quite sure what that is asking. Um, maybe you can clarify your I question. I think I understand there. what I, I, okay. I'm going to take a stab at that. Uh, this is, I, I think somebody here, I think it was, uh, maybe you, Bronson, or, or Rod had said that uh, you've got a few deals that uh, you we're going to do. I think Rod said he was going to do CapEx. He was like, do maybe roofs and stuff like that. And the tenants mm -hmm. were starting to get a little squirrely on collections. So they said, okay, mm -hmm. we're going to hold off 
on doing CapEx projects right now. So yeah. um, I think that what Albert's trying to say here is, should we as operators focus on your reserve and, and setting money aside for CapEx and putting that in front of the investor obligations in the PREF? And I think absolutely you should- Better believe that. it, better yeah. believe it. You are taking Right now, cash is king. Liquidity yep. is everything. Okay. Liquidity yeah. is everything. So, yeah. you know, as an operator, if you're, if you're passively invested in a deal and, and the operator stops distributions I, I, to err on the side of caution, be grateful for that. Okay. Yeah. And, and don't, don't be you. angry about yeah. it. Be grateful yeah. because that's an operator that's got their eye on the ball and they're conserving cash. And, and, uh, you know, and we didn't stop distributions on that particular asset, but we're, we're doing interior finishes. We're getting decent bumps anywhere. I'm like, screw it. We're going to yeah. stop finishing interiors for the time being. And, uh, but you know, we had to, we had to stop distributions on an asset we have in Nashville because we had a fire, pretty good excuse. 20 units got burned up. Thank God nobody yeah. died. But, uh, you know, so, you know, if, if, but if somebody has got their eye on the ball and they stop distributions, don't be pissed off about it. Like I say, be grateful because they're, they're watching what's going on. Oh, but you're only taking you're only taking care of your investors long term. If, you, if you if you fill your reserve your reserve buckets and set some money aside for capex, you are taking care of your investors long term. And the best thing that we can all do is to be transparent with our investors on what we're doing and to say, hey, this is what we're doing. Send out regular communications. We're holding up distributions because this because we're going to fill the buckets. We're going to set. We're going to you know fill up our war chest here and that kind of thing. Something you said is super important. Communication is critical. Yes. If you're with an operator that's not communicating well, that's a problem. Okay. And and as an operator, and if you're watching and you're an operator, over communicate right now so that you minimize the fear and the you know people need to hear from you. They need to know what's going on, the good and the bad. So, yeah, that's that's really great. I think. Um, you know, right. It's all about pre preservation of capital, right? Not having a loss. And again, this has been a lot of unexpected things that happen to have, you know, almost a 5% increase in the federal you know, or higher in the, in the, in the rate uh, in a very short period of time. And so being conservative is obviously very important. Um, a couple other questions here coming through. Um, there's somebody asking about how do I find out about other deals? Matt mentioned his uh, debt fund deal. Um, we have uh, our ATM oil and gas, and we've got a car wash deal opening up in a bit. I've got our investment club email, uh, put that in the chat there. You guys, uh, panelists, put your stuff in there if you have something you want to add in there too. Mm -hmm. um, what MSAs currently are looking good for multifamily investing? What parts of the country? Or is it just, it, it all depends, right? <laughs> I mean, we love Texas and Florida and the Carolinas and Georgia, but the insurance is just freaking insane right now. So we're actually looking in North Georgia, Tennessee, uh, Ohio, uh, Indiana, you know, uh, markets. I'm in a couple of those markets already, but you know, I'm just, I'm, de I don't want to fight the insurance that we're paying right now. So until that settles down, um, you know, that's where we're looking. But uh, yeah, that's my answer, uh, Mike. You. Well, we're that? we're in we're in Atlanta area, right? But the the thing is, there's there's a lot of good markets out there. I mean, really, you're looking at a market that is growing in population, and just the Sun Belt is just growing. It has been yeah. ever since COVID, right? So there's so many different markets that you can go into, go into, and, and uh, it's not one particular market. And you know, before you say well, which one's less competitive, they're equally competitive. <clears throat> so, you know, it, I don't know. You, you got to do your diligence. You want to, you want definitely want a growing market. You want a, a market that's growing in population and job growth. Okay. And then within yeah. that market, you want to be able to find deals that cash flow. That's why you're not looking in, I don't know, the Bay Area. Let's say I don't even know if that's growing or not, but you're not finding cash flowing assets in there. And so that's the intersection, right? So uh, Dallas and, and uh, you know, Austin to some degree and Atlanta, the Carolinas, those are all great markets, right? So I would just say, do your diligence and then pick yeah. one of them. Right. A reminder real quick, this replay will be available um, later tonight. It'll be on our YouTube channel as well as emailed to you. So you'll get some information about this if you want to share it or you want to, you missed part of it or came in late. So feel free. Um, there was somebody's asking what percentage of mortgages is possibly going to reset. I think Rod, you said yeah, one point six trillion by the end of next year. Okay, yeah, great. You know what percentage yeah. that is potentially, or is it just? It's oh, I don't know. I don't know percent yeah. wise. That's the dollar amount. I mean, yeah, by it. the way, guys, a trillion is a lot it's of a lot. money. Right. If you want to compare, look at a graph or a picture, a visual of a billion compared to a trillion. It'll blow your mind. So, yeah, it's it's significant money. Um, there's a question asking about our car wash investment coming up. We have one coming up next month. Um, real quick, I want to touch base. This is called a private equity roll-up strategy. So basically, it exists in dental offices and in car washes and gas stations and all kinds of things where if you have less than 10 of them, 
they sell for maybe eight to 10 times earnings. But if you have 50 of them, they sell for 20 to 30 times earnings, right? So part of the strategy is going and either building or creating more of these car washes, whatever the asset is. And then there's some of these share on the upside with investors as well. So that's called private equity rollout that'll be out next month. Uh, what are some, uh, let's see, I guess- Red this, flags. This from, yeah, I the red, red flags. flags. Show the yeah, red I've, flag. got, I've got an answer to that. Uh, I've got a free resource uh, if you write this down. Uh, it's questions you should ask a GP before investing in a deal. It's about 52 questions there. That'll really help you, Chaitanya. Um, if you text GP questions to 72345, uh, I mean, I could go through some of them if you want me to right now, Bronson, but that's a great resource. GP questions yeah. to 72345. Um, it's a free thing. And again, I'm not going to try to sell you anything. It's just a free resource for you. Sure. Um, no, that's great. We definitely can follow up on that. There's more questions too. Um, mm -hmm. What are some key risks? Um, I'll put this out. I have some thoughts on this because we do a lot of alternative assets, but what do you think are some key risks to look at when investing in ATMs and oil and gas and, and other types of alternative assets that you're unfamiliar with? For me, it's shiny nickels, right? I mean, like if, you, if you're investing uh, because you're bored or because you think, oh, multifamily is not hot, or if you feel like you're, you're, that you're speculating, then you're not investing. And the operator you're investing with, if this is something that it's not vetted and researched without like an operations leg of the business, then that, up, then that person raising the capital is probably speculating also. The last thing you want to do is go taking your hard-earned money to the roulette wheel of investing right now because um, you're likely going to lose with all the changes that we just talked about. So I think that do your own homework and make sure that the operator you're investing with has also. Why would you give your hard-earned money to someone without having a basic understanding of what yeah. it is? Okay, yeah. come go yeah. to Michael's event. His is coming right up. I've yeah. got one coming up in September in Orlando, three-day event. You know, even if you're only going to invest passively, don't give your hard-earned money to someone without having a basic understanding of what it is. That's just that's the definition of crazy. Okay, so so you know, again, you can invest passively, but. If you've got a basic understanding, you'll be able to protect yourself and have, you know, and and, and at least have an, a basic understanding of, um, you know, the, the asset class, be it, be it ATMs, be it oil and gas, be it multifamily. You know, if it's multifamily, come to Michael or my boot camp and, and you'll, you know, drink through a fire hose. Yeah. yeah. And I think too, I actually have a book coming out shortly about this, about how do you analyze deals outside of real estate or the source of alternative assets. And it really works the same as it works with real estate. As you look at the market, so what is the market for, you know, we buy in Jacksonville, Florida or whatever for multifamily, what is the market for ATMs or what's the market for oil and gas? Or what does that actually look like? Is there a growing market? Is there demand for it? What, how does that actually look? And then who is the person or the team that's actually doing this? Have they done it before? Is it a rinse and repeat? I mean, there's a lot of steps to that, but you figure out, you know, what's the market? What's the, who's the operator? What's their experience? And what is the actual deal? Does it make sense? Warren Buffett says, we only do deals that we understand. We don't, you know, for years, he didn't invest in a lot of tech things. He didn't understand. So only do things that you understand to Rod's point. Anybody have anything to add to that? We should all go buy Bitcoin right now. Yeah. Because I'm sure you know, everybody, just, you everybody know, funny. I was just Bitcoin. literally so listening. understand how that's working, right? We didn't give a disclaimer on that. We didn't give a disclaimer that says anything we say here is just our opinions. Don't I, I was do it. literally just <laughs> listening Sumat, to the billionaire, <laughs> billionaire named Sailor, last name Sailor about Bitcoin, literally just before this thing. Because what, what you know, he said now? There's no way he's still a bull. What's that? There's no way Sailor is a bull for Bitcoin. Is he still a bull? I don't know. I, it was he was on Tucker. I just saw a Tucker interview. I don't know how old it was. I did, I should check the date on it. But uh, yeah, who knows? But uh, but anyway, um, I was just yeah. making a joke because uh, you know Warren Buffett made the same same thing about it. he. You couldn't sell him all the Bitcoin in the world for one dollar. Yeah, I know. I know. That, that was things. why I never even checked it out before this yeah. point because of what he said. I mean, you know, uh, but, yeah. you know, someone else, I was at, in Miami and the guy that, that I hung out with, it's like, you should check out Bitcoin and see this guy. I'm like, okay, I'll listen to what he's got to say because I don't know a thing about it. But uh, Paul says yeah. big time bull. He bought a bunch recently. So, okay, there you oh, go. Well, Bitcoin is rebounding. has been rebounding yeah. recently, right? Yeah. So, I don't own any. Do you own any? I don't own any. I, yeah. I have a little bit. I, I stick with, I stick in my lane. Every time I get out of my lane, I get my ass handed to me. So I stick yeah. in my lane. This is the thing. If this is an example. Is, and the only reason I don't own, I own it, I don't understand it. And But I've asked very smart people to explain it to me. And I don't, I still don't understand the fundamentals of Bitcoin, right? So you got to understand the fundamentals of a business. And this is what Warren Buffett is really good at. He understands how to underwrite a business and come up with a valuation. I don't know how he does it. For me, a multifamily is much easier, but he can do it with a business. And so you got to understand the fundamentals of whatever you're investing. You have to understand what the drivers are, right? And if it, it makes sense it. to you, 
boom. That's if it. it. Make that's it. To you, like, ah, yeah. oh, Don't well. just give your money to somebody for God's sakes. Don't be lazy, please. Yes. No. yes exactly. I'm going to throw a link in. I'm going to throw a link in for my event. If yeah. you guys are Let, interested, let's, let's do this. Yeah. Too. Let's take a couple more minutes. Um, yeah. we'll put your links in there. Anything you're mm -hmm. promoting, stick it in the, uh, the the chat there. I really appreciate you guys coming on here. We are uh, a couple little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we do this event once a month. We do it uh, typically on multifamily one month, and then we'll go talk about other things. So we talk about inflation. We talk about investing. We have an economic roundtable on the 27th of June, which is a Tuesday at 4 p.m. at the same time, 4 p.m. Pacific. And it's uh, we have a guy named uh, Joe Brown with Heresy uh, Financial who's got you know two or 300,000 YouTube subscribers. Really, really smart guy. We're going to have some smart people on there. It's going to be a great event. If you're interested in hearing about our deals, we've got ATMs open now, car washes next month. We've got oil and gas stuff that we're doing, technology in that space. These guys are doing debt funds, real estate funds, raising for different things, oil and gas. Please, please reach out to them. Michael's got his event coming up. Rod does as well. Matt, do you have an event that you're doing as well? I just go speak at other people's events. I'm too lazy, Bronson, to do it. It's my much own. easier. I, I've been doing that. <laughs> yeah. smart, I, I, smart might be the word, really. <laughs> yeah. We I have just a like one... to go hang out with Michael and Dallas and, you know, do like a hang out with all the people that they put together and all that. So I, I, I do not do my own events, uh, but but I really enjoy going to them and speaking at them. So I'm really excited to see Michael there. And I'm going to um, MF and Con, a multifamily investor. <laughs> <Con. laughs> I'll be there too. Are you, are you yeah. going there, Michael? Uh, You're going to be in Charlotte? I will not know. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay. you to Shaquille uh, O'Neal for calling it MF and Con. MF and Con. Yeah, yeah, that was funny, wasn't it? Yeah, that was hilarious. Yeah, by good. the way, just a one quick little plug. My super early birds 197 for my event. Kind of a no-brainer if you but it's only for another couple of days. FYI. Um, so somebody's asking, thanks for that, Rod. Somebody's asking where we get the future links. Uh, you will get notified uh, about future events when the event is available. Um, we'll send you future links for this. You'll be on our list unless you unsubscribe. I'm uh, trying to bring value to you guys. Um, and then the last thing I was going to share, I, was, I had something else I was going to share that was great and I just lost it. But uh, regardless, uh, really great. You got, oh, I was going to share this. We have, we're having our first live event. We do run a meetup in Pasadena, California, about 80 investors. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Uh oh every month the first wednesday of the month you went you went out a little bit there for a second buddy oh, i, would I did okay, okay. Said, i'll yeah. repeat it yeah so we have a meetup uh for its its investors it's a multifamily meetup about 80 investors the first wednesday of the month in the glendale california area so if you're in the area you want to let me know uh also we're having an event october 19th and called the advanced real estate investing summit so check that out and uh anyway i appreciate everybody for being here Rod, Matt, Michael, you guys are studs and heroes. Appreciate each of you guys for you bring the mindset, the experience, the operations. Just love, you know, Bronson, working with you guys. You. And I know it takes a lot. Good to see you guys. Good to see you guys. And it's again, once again, we'll, we'll send out the yeah. replay once this is available. Thanks to everybody for joining. And uh, please share this with others so we can help promote this event. Thanks, everybody. Michael, Bye. Matt, Bronson, great to see you guys. Be Rod, well. Great great guys. You, Thank you so All much. Right, see you. See you, Michael. See you.